Hi history lovers, I have something a little different for you this week as I give you my list of the top 20 things to do in London if you're a history buff like me and want to spend your holidays coming as close to time travelling as you can. This list would require at least a fortnight to complete, which I realise most people won't have, so my advice if you're planning to visit London is to watch the video and just cherry pick the things which appeal to you the most and which you can fit into the time you have available and your budget. Speaking of budgets, I've included a mix of paid and free options and I'll also be giving you a little tip at the end about how you can get very cheap central London accommodation depending on what time of year you're there and save some money on ticket prices for certain attractions. The suggestions are in no particular order but I have tried to group things together that you can do in one day and or which go well together. If you stay till the end, I'll also give you not one, but two bonus suggestions for things which aren't in London, but which are close enough to do in a day trip and well worth a visit. Finally, even if you're not planning on visiting England's capital city anytime soon, I think you'll enjoy this video anyway as a way to travel vicariously through your screen. Disclaimer time. Obviously what follows is just my opinion and based on information available to me at the time of creating the video, so you should check things like prices and opening times before you travel. I have listed websites for the attractions mentioned in the description box, but again, you should look at these sites yourselves and make sure you're happy with them before you part with any money. I won't be sharing prices here as they change so often that the video would become outdated very quickly if I did. Okay then, let's get stuck in. Number one, the Tower of London. This is of course a must for any history lover coming to London, assuming you can suck up the heavy ticket price. It is an all day affair, seriously allow a good five hours for it, maybe even six if you're determined to see everything, and enjoy visiting things like the Crown Jewels of the United Kingdom, the execution site and final resting place of the likes of Anne Boleyn, Catherine Howard and Lady Jane Grey, which is actually where you'll be queuing up to get in to see the Crown Jewels, by the way, the building in which the princes in the tower were last held, and much more. My top tips for going to the tower are to get there at opening time as it fills up very fast and go straight to the Crown Jewels as the queues for these can become horrendous later on in the day. If you want to get into the chapel of St Peter at Vincula, where Anne, Catherine and Jane etc are buried, make sure too that you check its opening times as it's closed sometimes for things like services and other events and you don't want to be disappointed. The Beefeaters tours which you can do are great fun but I also advise that you take some of what they say with a pinch of salt. Mine told us that Anne Boleyn was executed on the green in front of the chapel, for example, where the glass pillow memorial is, but that isn't true. Number two, Tower Bridge. And by the way, if you hear me oscillating between saying tar and tower, it's because tar is how we say it in Northern Ireland, but I sometimes say tower because I get grief from people whining about my accent when I say it my way. It's hard to remember to switch to an American accent for just that one word though, and so you'll quite often hear me, not just in this video, sliding between the two, and it's just not worth the hassle of re-recording sections for that, so you might hear both. Okay, situated right next to the tar, this is a marvel of Victorian engineering, and at the very least, I recommend you take a walk across it, which is of course free, but did you know that you can also pay to go inside the bridge? Well, you can, and I have, and while it's a fairly short activity, taking only around an hour and a quarter, it's quite the experience. The bridge has glass floors which allow you to walk over the top of traffic and pedestrians below, plus short videos playing within the bridge walk and in the towers at either end to tell you about the history of the structure. This is a great little filler activity if you want to put in some time at the start or end of your day, and tickets can be bought online ahead of time if you wish. Number three, HMS Belfast. This is something else which is basically right next to the Tower of London, albeit on the other side of Tower Bridge. A battleship built back in the 1930s and which was decommissioned in the early 1960s, I couldn't believe that I somehow hadn't done this attraction until recently. After all, it's named after my country's capital city. 
I spent over two hours on this boat, which is far bigger than you would think, as many of the rooms are below the waterline, and I loved it. Rare for me, as I wouldn't say I'm big into naval history. It's a great snapshot of life on board ship, and you can use the audio guide to traverse it at your own pace. You'll see where the men, and they were all men, ate, slept, played, and recuperated from illness and injury. You can visit the torpedo bays too, plus the captain's bridge. And if you're like me, you can even get lost for 10 to 15 minutes in the engine and boiler rooms when you're desperate for the loo. There are loos on board, by the way, plus a small cafe, and the gift shop is on shore. There are a lot of narrow staircases and even ladders to be negotiated here, though, so do bear that in mind. The ship was built to be functional, not particularly comfortable, and that hasn't changed now that it's a floating museum. Number four, the Houses of Parliament. You'll need to book tickets ahead of time for this and arrive early to allow for security. You can't take pictures inside the building except in the stunning medieval Westminster Hall, which is where you'll start your tour from. Make sure to look at its floor while you're there to see the plaques which mark places where different royals lay in state after death and where Charles I was tried. The tour of the palace itself is amazing. The artwork on the walls is gorgeous and you'll learn all about the history of the building and of Parliament itself. If you visit when Parliament isn't in session, you can even get into the chambers. I sat just a couple of rows behind the PM's seat, for instance. No need to fear if Parliament is in session, though. Once your tour is over, you can go back, sit in the galleries and watch the debates, which I did recently. Some of the lords were fast asleep, by the way, which I thought was insane as they get paid to be there. You might have a small delay before you can do this, though, as there is limited seating in the visitors' galleries and you'll need to wait for someone to leave to free up a spot for you. School parties also take priority, so you might get bumped down the queue for them. That happened to me and it was annoying. There is a nice, if moderately small, restaurant and gift shop leading off Westminster Hall, plus toilets. Assuming the hall and the main tour are all you're doing, this is a two, two and a half hour long jaunt, plus 30 minutes for security at the start, though hopefully it won't take that long, but it could take that long. There is an extra thing you can do, though, which will add another 90 minutes to your time at Westminster, and that is a tour of the Elizabeth Tower, which houses the famous Big Ben. I did this recently and it was fantastic, but I have to warn you that booking tickets for it is like trying to get tickets for a Taylor Swift concert. Not that I've ever done that because she's never played Belfast, but this is what I imagine it would be like. They go on sale on a particular day each month at 10am, check their website for up-to-date details, and they sell out in seconds. Not minutes, seconds. This is because they can only have, I think, 16 people per tour. Myself and my friend actually rearranged the whole timing of our trip in order to accommodate the only day and time slot we could get which still had two tickets available for the tour. If you are lucky enough to get one, there are no photographs allowed. In fact, you'll leave all your belongings in a locker in a little room off Westminster Hall and there are hundreds of stairs to climb, so this isn't for you if you can't manage that. I would equate it to going up inside the dome in St Paul's Cathedral or maybe inside the Statue of Liberty if you've ever done that. The guide I got, who was called David by the way, was so good and so knowledgeable and the tour was a joy. We got to watch the actual bell bong on the R, we were provided with earplugs before it happened, and stand directly behind the four clock faces you see when you look up at the tower from outside. He also told us an enormous amount about the history of the tower and the bell. If you're able to get tickets for this, and I should warn you that they aren't cheap, then I think you'll really enjoy it. Number five, Westminster Abbey. Situated right next door to the Houses of Parliament, you could just about do both in a day if you wanted, which is why I'm listing them back to back. I've been here several times and I always love it. I judge abbeys, cathedrals and churches on how famous and numerous their dead people are, and Westminster does not disappoint. It has a huge number of royal burials, including Elizabeth I, Mary I, Edward VI, their grandparents, Henry VII and Elizabeth of York, plus Lady Margaret Beaufort, Anne of Cleves, more medieval monarchs than I can list, and of course, Poets' Corner, where you'll find the likes of Geoffrey Chaucer and Charles Dickens. Lots of Stuarts and Hanoverians are there too, though most of them do not have grand tombs, the exception being Mary, Queen of Scots, 
and many just have floor plaques, which you'll need to watch out for so that you don't miss them. You can also see the beautiful Cosmati pavement where the altar is, and which you'll recognise from footage of the Prince and Princess of Wales' wedding back in 2011. Allow at least three hours to do the Abbey justice. You can eat while you're there in their Crypt Cafe, which I have always found to do really nice food. Number six, the Churchill War Rooms. Again, these are extremely close to the Abbey and Parliament, and that's why I'm grouping them together with those locations. You could do two of them on the same day, though I personally think it would be a bit much and lead to you rushing things. The Churchill War Rooms are the large underground bunker from which Winston Churchill largely ran the Second World War, and they are now a museum which recounts the history of the rooms themselves and the war more generally. There is a great audio guide which allows you to move around at your own pace, an underground cafe, fairly small but the novelty here is really about where you're eating, and even the original door of number 10 Downing Street, plus original letters, photographs and items of clothing from Winston's life. You can, I believe, just rock up and buy tickets at the entrance, but I purchased mine ahead of time so that I didn't have to queue for as long. Number 7. St Paul's Cathedral This late 17th century cathedral was built to replace the one which burnt down in the Great Fire of London in 1666, and was designed by Christopher Wren. It is gorgeous to look at, though it's well hidden from view on most sides by later buildings, and includes memorials and grave sites for yet more famous people, such as Florence Nightingale, to give just one example. You can now visit the famous Whispering Gallery again, after it was shut for several years due to health and safety concerns, and while you're up there, why not, your own health allowing, carry on up inside the dome to the very top for some amazing, if sometimes blustery, views of London. Be warned though that if you do decide to ascend to the top of the dome, it's hundreds of stairs and involves climbing up some very tight spiral staircases. You'll need to be fairly fit to do this, and you also need a decent head for heights, as the viewing platform at the top is very narrow, its surrounding wall is not that high, maybe a little above my waist, and it's a long way down. I would allow a couple of hours for St Paul's, and I actually did it on the same day that I did Westminster Abbey, though my feet did really hurt by the end of it, and I would have liked to have spent an extra hour at the Abbey, but we were meeting friends at St Paul's, so I had to leave, so... Maybe don't try to do them in the same day. You can, but I wouldn't particularly advise it having done it myself. Number eight, the Globe Theatre. Here, history meets literature, as you can visit the Globe not only for a guided tour telling you about the institution's past and its connections to William Shakespeare and Elizabethan England, but also to watch one of the Bard's plays. It is open air, and while there's some roofing over the audience, I wouldn't recommend this if the weather is howling. Be aware too, please, that the current globe is not the original building, which is long gone and actually sat on a different site a few hundred yards away. Instead, what you see now is a reconstruction opened in 1997. It's just down the river from St Paul's Cathedral, so could be done on the same day if you wished. Number nine. Buckingham Palace. This is actually a three-in-one recommendation as you can buy one ticket which will get you into the King's Gallery, formerly the Queen's Gallery, the Royal Mews and, if you're visiting during the summer when they're open, the state apartments inside the palace. Alternatively, you can buy individual tickets if you don't want to see it all. Just check their website and see what suits you best. The King's Gallery is an art gallery on the left-hand side of Buckingham Palace as you look at its front entrance, and it runs exhibitions during most of the year, showcasing art, photographs and material objects from the Royal Collection. This is where I saw Princess Charlotte's wedding dress, for example. Depending on how long you want to look at each item for, this can take about 90 minutes. Bear in mind it was 90 minutes for me because I was photographing everything like crazy, but other people could probably do it faster. The amazing thing about this gallery, though, is the fact that they do allow you to photograph the artworks at all. In most of the royal residences where these works live the rest of the time, photography is not allowed. I've seen these two portraits of Edward VI and Elizabeth I on the walls of Windsor Castle a couple of times, for instance, but I was never able to photograph them until they were in the King's Gallery. Now for the Royal Muse. 
This is where the royal cars, carriages and horses are kept. I'm not terribly interested in travel history, she said in the middle of a travel guide video, so this was my least favourite of the three venues, but it does include the Gold State coach, which I did really enjoy seeing and ended up making a whole video on, so it was worth it in the end and it only took an hour or so, again partly because I was photographing everything in sight. Finally we have the big daddy of this visit, the state apartments of Buckingham Palace. Be warned that you can't photograph anything in here, but you'll understand why if you visit. It's so full of tourists that if everyone was allowed to stop and take pictures, the entire place would grind to a halt. It's absolutely stunning, you'll not see this much gold leaf outside of somewhere like Versailles in France, and a fantastic thing to see if you're looking to treat yourself. At the time of creating this video, it has recently been announced that more of the palace is going to be opened up so that tourists can see the famous balcony, from the inside that is, but as that option wasn't available when I was there in 2023, I can't tell you anything more about it. Once you're done with your self-guided tour, there is an audio guide I think, you'll exit out into the palace's back garden, where the famous garden parties take place. There you'll find a smallish restaurant, toilets and a gift shop. There aren't any loos which you can access inside the palace, so make sure you go before you enter. You'll pop back out onto the main street by first walking through part of the gardens, which are lovely and worth a look in their own right, though you're only allowed into a portion of them. All in, I would allow at least two hours for the State Apartments experience, perhaps more now than another range of the palace is being opened up. I do have a few additional tips for you as well if you opt to do this palace day. First, if you get all three tickets, which come in a bundle and are referred to as the Royal Day Out package on the website, then you'll have timed entry to each thing, so watch that you don't miss your slot. Second, be prepared for airport style security at each location and allow extra time for that, at least 20 minutes, especially for the state apartments, which will likely have the worst queues in my experience, but check the website and see if it advises any more than that. Third, this is an expensive undertaking and probably a once-in-a-lifetime experience, unless you visit twice during a calendar year. In that case, make sure you get each of your three tickets stamped during your first visit so that they become one-year passes, and then you can get back into any one of these sites within the next 12 months for free, although you do have to ring up in order to book your tickets, I remember having to do that. Remember too, the staterooms are only open for a few weeks in the summer, so you'll need to time your two trips very carefully to be able to reuse that part of your ticket. I reused my King's Gallery ticket though, and so got to see a second exhibition eight months after the first at no additional cost. I could have done the Muse again too, but I wasn't interested. Number 10. Kensington Palace Situated about an hour's walk away from Buckingham Palace, Kensington Palace is the former home of the likes of Queen Victoria and Diana, Princess of Wales. The palace is also still used as a home by current royals, but of course you won't get to see those parts of it. Instead, you'll see where primarily the Hanoverians lived, including the room in which Victoria was born, and another where she held her first council meeting after becoming Queen. You can take pictures inside, which is amazing, there's some really great art on the walls, and there's a nice cafe and gift shop at the end of the self-guided audio tour. The gardens are also lovely and include the famous, or perhaps infamous, as it wasn't terribly popular from what I remember, statue of Diana with two children. Allow at least a couple of hours for your visit. Number 11. The Royal Parks. London has some incredible parks, officially called the Royal Parks, that you can visit for free, and several are very close to some of the attractions I've just described to you, so you could do one after the other. Given their association with the Royal Family and how old they are, I decided I could get away with listing them in a history lover's guide. St James's Park is directly in front of Buckingham Palace. It includes a lake, places to eat, and even pelicans. Then there's Green Park on the other side of the palace. I've walked through here a couple of times on my way from the tube station to the palace. Or Hyde Park, which is the one you'll need to traverse in order to get from Buckingham Palace to Kensington Palace, that's assuming that you're walking, and it runs into Kensington Gardens. 
It also has a huge lake, places to stop and eat, and includes the Diana Memorial Garden with its water feature. In fact, the reason that it took me an hour to walk from Buckingham Palace to Kensington Palace was because I did a pit stop at the Diana Garden. Another royal park I went to recently was Regent's Park, which has its own zoo and takes you towards Primrose Hill for some great views out over London, if you're prepared to climb it. There are others, including Greenwich Park, which you can do if you want to go to Greenwich Observatory, but it's up a huge hill, so don't say I didn't warn you. Basically, Google the parks before you go to London and see what's close to you and to other things you're going to see. In all cases, though, please watch out for the cyclists in these locations, unless you are one, in which case, please watch out for the pedestrians. Speaking of the observatory, that brings us to number 12. The Royal Observatory at Royal Museums Greenwich mixes history and science and is child-friendly, so this might be a good compromise if you find yourself travelling with people who, for some inexplicable reason, don't have the same love of history as you and I, and want to see some outer space stuff instead. By the by, the astronomy offerings here are actually really good too, so it shouldn't be a chore for you to see that stuff as well. At this roughly 250-year-old site, you can, among other things, stand on the Prime Meridian Line and see the famous Octagon Room, commissioned by Charles II and designed by Christopher Wren. Yes, the same guy who designed St Paul's. It's not free, but it's also not one of the more expensive items on this list. That honour goes to the likes of Big Ben, Buckingham Palace and the Tower of London. Your ticket doesn't cover everything available though, it doesn't include planetarium shows for instance, so do check in advance what the extras are that you'll have to pay separately for. Number 13. The National Portrait Gallery. This is an absolute must for history nerds. It's free, it allows photography, and it includes portraits and busts of some of the most famous people in British history and beyond. It's got a whole gallery on the Plantagenets and the Tudors, which is where I got many of my pictures of them, and it runs short talks on a lot of its more famous artworks too. I just happened across a talk in progress on the portraits of Elizabeth I it has, for instance, including her famous coronation portrait. It is quite big, and you're going to need to allow a minimum of two hours, I would say, though I spent longer there as I was taking so many pictures. It took me 45 minutes just to get out of the Plantagenet Tudor Gallery, for example. Its cafe is pretty small, be warned, with a fairly limited choice, but you don't have to eat there if you don't want to. When I visited the gallery in the summer, it was packed, and even though I was in the queue half an hour before opening, it was still very busy as soon as I was through the doors. When I visited in April, it was much quieter and I just walked in in the middle of the day. The great thing about the NPG though is that you can do it in conjunction with the attraction, which is at number 14 on my list. Number 14, the National Gallery. This is right next door to the National Portrait Gallery, literally a 30 second walk around the corner, and faces out into Trafalgar Square, which you can, of course, take a look around as well while you're there and see the famous monument. In fact, you might want to arrive before either gallery opens and have a look at the square then. You may have to queue at the steps of the National Gallery to get in, but it's free to visit and you can happily spend a couple of hours there, if not longer. Its basement cafe is also relatively limited, but not too bad. The interior of this building upstairs in the main galleries is something else, though. I shot this footage of the ceiling because it's just so stunning. Really, though, my camera doesn't do it justice, and that's before we get to the art on the walls. Again, there are images of lots of very famous historical figures, places, and events, and notable works of art to look out for include the execution of Lady Jane Grey, which I did a whole video on, Hans Holbein's paintings of Christina of Milan and the Ambassadors, the Arnolfini portrait, and a personal favourite of mine, the Ugly Duchess. Try to get a map if you can, as this place is a bit of a maze. Number 15. Kew Palace. This is outside the city centre, so be prepared for a fairly lengthy tube ride, and it's also one of the smaller royal palaces you'll visit, more of a country home in its day, really. It's where Queen Charlotte died, and in fact I recall seeing the exact chair in which she died during my visit there, and while the house tour won't take that long given its size, you'll definitely want to check out the gardens, which include a gorgeous pagoda. 
For this reason, you should try to go on a dry day. You're also pretty close to Heathrow here, so be prepared to see and hear lots of planes flying overhead. Given how far out of the main city it is, I don't think you'll do anything else on the day you go here. Number 16. Hampton Court Palace. Speaking of day trip venues, that brings us to the much more impressive Hampton Court Palace, which is again an all-day affair and will require some forward planning, as you'll need to get the train out to Richmond to visit it. From the front, it's a Tudor-style palace, originally built for Thomas Wolsey and then taken over by Henry VIII. From the side, it's all Stuart, thanks to the intervention of William III. The inside also includes this mix of architecture and decor. You'll see the clock court outside and the Great Hall upon entering, with the priceless Tudor tapestries on the walls. Then there's the supposedly haunted gallery, where Catherine Howard's ghost apparently roams sometimes, plus some beautiful and world-famous artwork on the walls, including the famous family of Henry VIII portrait, and the room in which he married Catherine Parr. There's also the chapel where Edward VI was christened, and bear in mind that no photography is allowed in there, although it is allowed elsewhere. You'll then move forward in time to the Stuart and Hanoverian eras and see the area of the palace in which they lived, with yet more fantastic artwork and historical artefacts. The gardens are an absolute must-see too and include a fantastic fountain and a large restaurant, though you'll have to walk a little way to get to it. Not a cheap day out, but well worth the money in my opinion. Number 17. The British Museum one of the most famous museums in the world, this is free to enter, but if you're there in peak season, be prepared for monstrous queues. I stood for 45 minutes one day in August, for example. This is in part because there is airport-style security to go through before you can enter. The museum includes some very famous artefacts, such as the Rosetta Stone and the Parthenon marbles, though it has taken a reputational bashing recently when it emerged that a now former employee was, allegedly, stealing and selling objects for years without anyone noticing. And I wonder if the Parthenon marbles in particular are going to have to be given back to Greece at some point, as the museum now struggles to argue that it's the best place to care for and protect them. Only time will tell. I'm now going to say something rather controversial about this attraction, which will sound very odd coming from an historian, and that is that I don't particularly enjoy the British Museum when I'm there. I've been at least twice that I can recall, and I just found myself getting a little bit bored. I went to see the very famous items I've just mentioned, and then wandered into the rest of the building, where I found things like rooms of old dishes in glass cases. That sort of thing doesn't really interest me though, and while they do have a good Egyptian display, I find a lot of the other displays to be a bit dull. I don't remember there being an audio guide, and perhaps if there was something like that to take me around the place and draw my attention to particularly fascinating objects and explain their history to me, I'd have gotten more out of my visits. It does have a lovely restaurant and shop though, so I have to give it that. I also think I'm probably an outlier in finding it a little boring. I imagine most other people love it, and if you've never been, it's certainly worth at least one visit. Number 18. The Victoria and Albert Museum I enjoyed this museum far more than the British Museum. It has a great mix of items, from paintings to clothing to reconstructed rooms and other material objects. Tudor nerds should look out for the portraits of the likes of Henry VIII, Edward VI and Anne of Cleves, which are in here, although Anne of Cleves is a miniature and was presented in a glass case that rendered it basically impossible for me to photograph it, which was disappointing. Entrance is free and the V&A has literally the most beautiful cafe I have ever been in in my life. It's a kind of art deco experience and is just gorgeous. The food was really good too. If you do visit, don't miss it. There's also a large and, I thought, very good shop, and you can go outside into the museum's central courtyard and admire its impressive architecture from there. In nice weather, kids will also enjoy splashing around in the water feature. I've only been here once, but unlike the British Museum, I'm chomping at the bit to go back. Allow two to three hours to feel like you've done this place justice. Number 19, the Natural History Museum. 
This is one of the few items on my list which I haven't yet been to myself, but it's very, very close to the B&A and I think you could do both in a day if you wanted to. It's free to enter, though you can book tickets to allow you to skip some of the queues when you arrive. Please note that exhibitions are not included in those tickets. You will have to pay extra for them. As the name suggests, this is a very different type of history to everything else I'm recommending, as it's primarily the history of the natural world rather than of human beings. If dinosaurs are your thing, though, then this is the place for you. People who have been can let us know in the comments below what you thought of it, but from looking at the website, I think it's very child-friendly, which is obviously going to be a big plus for many people. Number 20. The Imperial War Museum I've actually talked about two of the Imperial War Museums already, the Churchill War Rooms and HMS Belfast, but there is another museum in the city which is part of this group, though I haven't been to it myself, and that is the Imperial War Museum London. Unlike the other two, it is free to enter, and as its website explains, it quote, covers all aspects of conflict involving Britain, its former empire and the Commonwealth, from the First World War to the present day. You'll see the machinery of war, like tanks and planes for instance, photographs of war zones, and can read and listen to first-hand testimonies from people who have lived through conflicts, including World War II. Definitely a must-see, I think, if this is a type of history that interests you, and probably worth a try even if you don't think it's your sort of thing. I'm not a big fan of war history myself, and yet really enjoyed the war rooms in HMS Belfast, so I think I might give this a try the next time I'm in London, given that the Imperial War Museum's group obviously puts together a very good museum experience, which can capture the attention of even someone like me, and I have no reason to doubt that this venue is just as good as the other two. So that brings us to the end of the main list. But I promised you I'd give you two bonus things to do which aren't in London, but which are close enough for you to do in a day trip, plus a tip about getting low-cost accommodation and another for saving some money on entrance fees. Before I get to this material though, if you're enjoying this content and getting value from it, please hit the like and subscribe buttons so that YouTube and I know that you approve. If you switch on the notification bell, you'll also be kept in the loop about when my new content goes live. You can find me on Patreon too, where I provide bonus material such as early access to ad-free videos, bonus podcasts and more. This week, for instance, I'm providing my two highest tiers of patrons with a list of an additional 10 historical things to do in London. Yes, another 10 things on top of the 22 I'm listing here. I also have an Amazon storefront, which you can check out to find my curated lists of history-themed books, movies, TV shows, and more. Both are linked below for you, along with my Instagram page. Thank you too to those of you who support the channel using the thanks button underneath videos, as your generosity always just blows me away. All right, now it's time for the bonus suggestions and tips. The first bonus place I recommend is Hever Castle in Kent most famous as the home of Anne Boleyn, though Anne of Cleves later lived there too. You'll need to catch a train out to Hever to go here, I'm assuming you don't have a car available to you, and when you get there it's a 20-ish minute walk through the English countryside to get to the castle, and by that I mean fields, very rural paths, and then eventually a road with no footpath. This is not something to attempt if you have mobility issues or very small children with you. Also, don't try it in bad weather. The castle itself is quite dinky as castles go. This is a total side note, but in terms of size, it reminds me of Malahide Castle in Ireland. But it is packed to the rafters with Tudor history, plus the history of the Astor family who owned it later on. Hever has one of the best collections of Plantagenet and particularly Tudor portraits I've ever seen. Only the National Portrait Gallery can rival it in my opinion and they generously allow you to photograph those pictures too, which is amazing because so many places don't let you do that. Not for any practical reason, like keeping the flow of people moving, but just to try to gatekeep history. I also found the room guides to be very well informed and pleasant, and had a lovely chat with one of them about Richard III while we were in the castle's gallery. I will say that the last time I was there, their audio guide was rather out of date, with references to portraits and objects being in locations that they were no longer in. 
This was a bit unfortunate and something I think could and should be addressed, but the castle was still a very enjoyable experience. And part of the reason the guide was out of date was because they had a great little exhibition showing some of the costumes from the TV show Becoming Elizabeth, which I really enjoyed getting to see. The gardens are incredible too, and I say that as someone who is not a great gardener. Make sure you try out the maze and walk down to the bottom of the main estate to see the gorgeous Italian gardens. Hever has a couple of good restaurants next to the castle itself and next to the Italian gardens, and do check out Hever Church on your way in or out, where Anne Boleyn's father is buried under a pretty impressive looking tomb. The other day trip you can do from London is to Windsor Castle. Again, you'll catch the train out and it will deposit you just a few minutes walk away from the castle. There is an enormous amount to do here, so try to get there early in the day. You can tour the castle itself, of course, no photography inside, I'm afraid. Visit St George's Chapel, where royals from Edward IV to Elizabeth II and Prince Philip are buried, and walk around Windsor Great Park, where I once saw Queen Elizabeth returning from Royal Ascot, highlight of my day and possibly my trip. There is a very pleasant restaurant inside the castle, along with some of the nicer public loos you're ever likely to come across. I find in general, actually, that the royal homes do good loos, even for the tourists, and I've been in quite a few of them at this point, so I know what I'm talking about. If you fancy a walk around afterwards, Eton School is close enough to dander down to, or the town of Windsor itself is very pleasant for a stroll. You can also see the Guild Hall, where King Charles and Queen Camilla were married in 2005. Now for my top tip for getting cheap, if basic, accommodation in London. This is to stay in university halls of residence. This can only be done if you are visiting outside of semester time, because otherwise the students are there, but it will allow you to be located in central London at a fraction of the price of a hotel. Unfortunately, the quality of these halls can vary greatly. I've stayed in them three times, once in Imperial College London's halls next to RADA, once in the University of London's halls in Bloomsbury, and most recently in Schaefer House in Euston. The Bloomsbury ones are the only ones I go back to, though I was there in about 2011, so for all I know, they aren't very good anymore. If you are going to halls, I advise you to bring flip-flops to wear in the bathrooms, and if you need a hairdryer, bring that too, because in my experience, one will not be provided. The website I use to book my rooms is universityrooms.com, but of course, as with all links I provide you, use this at your own risk and it's up to you to do your own research and decide if something is right for you. As for saving some money on entrance fees, this can be achieved by taking out a one-year membership of Historic Royal Palaces, which will grant you free access to the Tower of London, Kensington Palace and Hampton Court Palace, plus Hillsborough Castle here in Northern Ireland if you happen to find yourself here, and 10% of the ticket price at Kew Gardens. There are some other benefits too, which are explained on the Historic Royal Palaces website, but obviously this might not be worth it if you're not going to go to enough of these places within the 12 months, so you'll need to look into it and see if it's suitable for you. All right, gang, that concludes my epic list of the top historical attractions in London. Of course, I haven't been able to include everything, and there are other things you can do which aren't historical. The London Eye springs to mind, for instance. But this list, if you do it all, should keep most of you busy for at least two or even three visits to the UK capital. Before I go, I'm going to quickly plug my website, historycallingofficial.com, where you can sign up for my mailing list and receive a free download which will give you five quick and easy tips for spotting good and bad history books before you buy or start reading them. You'll also then get my newsletter and marketing information which will keep you up to date with all things history calling, including upcoming projects. The site is linked below for you and you can unsubscribe at any time. Let me know in the comments what your favourite thing to do in London is or what attraction you'd most like to visit if you were going there. I'll be back next time and until then, as always, keep learning.